Good morning, good day, good evening, colleagues, and thank you very much for joining the webinar today. The first one of a series of webinars, briefing webinars. Today's agenda is about agenda item five on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework of the third meeting of a subsidy body on implementation. And I would like to start to invite Ms. Elizabeth Mar Maruma Marema, the Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity, to provide us with a few welcome remarks. Ms. Marema, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Charlotte. Can you hear me? Please confirm. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dear colleagues, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar uh, today on post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, including post-2020 implementation plan and capacity building action plan for the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. Despite challenging times we are all living in, I hope and pray that all of you are doing well and healthy. At the outset, I would like to thank the SBA chair for her leadership in preparing for the third meeting of the subsidiary body on implementation. I think we all know that subsidiary body for implementation will have a lot on its plate when one reviews its agenda items. But I'm also confident that under the chair's guidance and leadership, the subsidiary body will be able to arrive at a set of recommendations that will help to carry forward the work of the convention and its protocols. I will equally like to thank our dear co-chairs of the open-ended working group on post-2020 global biodiversity framework for being with us today. Their stewardship and leadership has been instrumental in helping us all to advance the process for developing the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and in ensuring that we all get ready for an ambitious and transformational post-2020 framework to be adopted and coming China. The recommendations developed under agenda item five will primarily be important to the future work of the convention and the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. They will be crucial to the work of the third meeting of the FN-ended working group later this year, but will also be essential to advance the development of an implementation plan and capacity building action plan for the Cartagena Protocol, which are anchored in and complementary to the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. As you may all know, subsidiary body on implementation, the third meeting will be the main intergovernmental intersessional meeting where these plans, will, <clears throat> these plans, the drafts of which have been developed through a two-year consultative process will be discussed before their consideration at the 10th meeting of the parties to the protocol. Our webinar today, as well as those being convened throughout this January, will help us to make the most of the opportunity that the subsidiary body for implementation, the third session, will provide. Dear colleagues, 2021 is shaping up to be an exciting but busy year. While COVID-19 pandemic continues to create uh, much uncertainty, I'm confident that with your support and collaboration, we will be able to navigate any obstacles we may encounter uh, as we go along. As always, myself, my colleagues at the Secretariat stand ready to support you on the final leg of our collective journey to Kumi, China. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Executive Secretary, for those welcoming remarks. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank you and your team for the work that has gone into organizing this series of webinars 
which will help parties and observers to better prepare for our work ahead. Thank you so much for all work. Dear colleagues, thank you for joining today, us today for this webinar related to agenda item five of the third meeting of SBI. This agenda item addresses the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, including the post-2020 implementation plan and capacity building action plan for the Katashina protocol on biosafety. The webinar today follows from earlier webinars related to SPI 3 on agenda item 3. And I think we should have a next slide. Yeah. You can see on the slide earlier webinars, review progress in the implementation of the convention, a sticky plan of biodiversity on mainstreaming and also on gender. Also, as communicated by the executive secretary through a notification earlier this month, later this week, we'll also have a webinar on agenda item, SPI item nine, which focuses on enhancing reporting and review mechanisms under the convention. And as I think you're all aware of, a number of webinars are also being prepared to address issues related to the agenda for SUBSTA 24. During the webinar today, we will receive an update on the progress in developing the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework from the co-chairs of Open Energy Working Group. And I will also provide some reflections on how, how I propose that agenda item five will be addressed at SBI3 and we will also have three presentations on the documentation prepared for the agenda item. So, and some housekeeping rules before we begin. We can have next slide. I would like to remind everybody, everyone that this webinar is intended to assist parties and observers in becoming familiar with the documentation for SBI3, its structure and content, and to respond to questions from participants. It's not a negotiation session, and the statements and views expressed during the webinars will not be considered part of the official work of SBI. In order to ask questions during today's session, please use the question window located on the right on your screen. You are free to ask questions at any point during the webinar. And when asking a question, we also would like to ask you to include your name and party or organization affiliation in order to help us to better manage the questions. And lastly, I will also like to inform you all that today's session is being recorded and that it will be made available on the Convergence website later in the week. With those remarks, I would now like to invite the co-chairs of Open Ended Working Group, Basil Fanav and Francis Ogwell, to provide us with an update of the post-2020 process and next steps. And following their presentations, we'll re respond to any questions that you may have through the quiz question window. So, coaches, Basil, Francis, you have the floor. Thank you. And I am going to show you my screen in a second. Uh, Charlotte, when you see my screen, let me know. It should be in a, in a few seconds. I will. Not yet. Not yet. Yes. Okay, should be sorry, it was my mistake. Yes, now I can see it. Good. So go Thank ahead. You. Okay, so uh, good day, everyone. 
Francis and I are delighted to have an opportunity to uh, provide you a, a brief update. And as usual, we'll take turn in, in presenting uh, a few slides. So without further ado, what uh, we want to show you today is, is, is repeat a little bit the, uh, the guiding principles, and I think those are important to keep in mind. Uh, talked about what the progress, what we've done. Um, do a little bit more on the connectivity between the various pieces, and, and and explain in our views how what um, what you're doing under SBI connect with Substar and connect with what we're doing. And then uh, we cannot have a presentation without showing the updated zero draft. You've seen that, so we'll go pretty quick, and then move on to next step. So. Um, the guiding principles so you've you've talked about the uh, the urgency to act and, and all that and and i don't think that's a a group of people i need to remind that what i want to be clear about is the principle this is a party-led process and we're here to listen to you to uh, to participate and at the end of the day the parties will have the final word it is participatory it is inclusive gender responsive transformative comprehensive catalytic, visible, knowledge-based, transparent, and, and efficient. So uh, bear with us. For example, um, we uh, want to note that um, uh, the document for SPI prepared by the Secretariat, they are not prepared by, by us, and we get to see them at the same time as, uh, as, you, as you see them. So it's also a process that is iterative and flexible. A process for everyone, and and we'll be we'll be uh, talking about that a lot, and and as we move through the various uh, uh, discussion, it is increasingly clear, clear that if we want that to be a success, it has to be a system that is open and enable the participation and the engagement of many many different uh, sectors. Moving on to what we've done. Um, so I'll go very quickly. You you know that we started with COP14. We went through regional consultation. The IBES assessment came. We had the first meeting around a, a very uh, good uh, series of thematics that is almost finished now. And open-ended working group two in Rome last year, and we drafted the updated draft. Um, moving on to the connection and and here it's not a timeline it's more kind of a a, a flow diagram or a theory of change and and, and basically uh, what we want to we want to explain that is is how the various pieces are coming together and the importance of the role that SEPSTA and SBI play so you will be having discussion on the planning review and and um, and, and reporting system yet those those discussions are hard to take in isolation of the discussion that will take place on indicators at SEPSTA. So uh, there is, I know, a lot of discussion back and forth between the chair, and, and I suppose that there will be also some discussion. Uh, we're going to get some advice, and those are the blue box in the center, and, and I'll draw your 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 attention at the bottom is that the the dual uh, outcome of SEP, of SBI that is going both uh, directly to us for preparing of draft one, but also to the COP, and that's quite normal and natural, and 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 I think we should uh, all recognize that. We will be preparing draft one after SEPSTA and SBI, and that's the document that will go to open ended working group three. What is uh, not uh, fully clear in my mind, at least it may be in, in uh, others, is how we're going to be um, um, working back and forth between the subsidiary body, not just SBI, but SBI and SEPSTA, and open-ended working group three. There will be negotiation. Um, there will be discussion on elements that are being discussed at, at SBI. And we're going to need to find a, a clever way to retain some flexibility to enable that to happen. So we have the best final package and the right <coughs> decision going uh, to, um, to COP. So um, that's the flow. I will now pass the, the floor to Francis that will take you through the last few slides. And, and Francis, over to you. And I'll be happy to turn the slide when you tell me so. 
Thank you, co-chair. Thank you. Um, I think we can then show slide the next slide. Now, uh, co-chair has been talking about this framework, but uh, this what you see is more like uh, a communication kind of tool here, because we have got the goals, we have got the milestones, we have got the action targets, all of them you see summarized in this one slide. So this is like something you could use for you know policymakers out there. But I'll try to say something <clears throat> slightly, then can go to the next slide. Um, in this framework, we are focusing at the long-term vision, the vision 2050, which was of course an outcome of COP10 and in Japan in 2010, and which says that by 2050 we are going to be living in harmony with the nature. But what does it actually mean uh, to believe in harmony with nature? At that meeting, it was agreed that there are four elements of living in harmony with nature. That is, nature has to be valued, nature has to be conserved, nature has to be restored and wisely used. So those are the elements of living in harmony with nature that once we're able to do those four, we should be able to really be appreciating nature. And then in that case, the outcome is that we shall be maintaining the ecosystem services, sustaining a healthy planet, and then delivering those benefits that is essential for all of us. Sustaining a healthy planet, as we have now seen with this pandemic, is going to be very crucial in the next uh, years to come, whether 20 or third or beyond even 2050. So we need a healthy planet if we are going to be healthy. So in crafting this uh, framework, we have taken on board those four elements of the living in harmony with the nature, and you'll see them reflected in some of those action targets. But also, we also did take into account the three objectives of the CBD, that is conservation, sustainable use, equitable sharing of benefits. So you'll see all this um, in this framework. So the framework has got um, the 2050 goals, you call them the long-term goals, but also the 2030 milestones. Why the milestones? The milestone is to help us see whether actually we are making progress towards those goals. And so the milestones have replaced what previously in the zero draft, if some of you would make reference, so if you're aware about that, that initially we were talking about 2030 goals, but after consultation it was found that we should be looking at the long-term goals and see how we are making progress towards that. So there are four, goals you can see goal a deals with ecosystem species and genetic diversity and just minutes below it are the uh, milestones dealing with the connectivity and integrity of protected areas number of threatened species uh, that uh, we have taken action to reduce them from that level of threat then there is the next target next goal that deals with the contribution of nature the well-being of uh, people and you see that talks to the other part already of the vision 2050. We're talking about nutrition, food. Nature is there to benefit us as human beings, but you also have a role to enhance and nurture nature. And then we are talking of valuing ecosystems as well. And when you see under milestone number two of that goal. So as you can see, I was telling you that those elements are included in this framework. Then there's a benefit sharing. You see it as another goal. And then goal D is about means of implementation. A framework which is there and is not resourced will at best just remain a framework. And so we have ourselves a target that by 2022, which is just next door, that we have the means to implement the first 10 years, which ends in 2030. And then by 2030, again, we have got the means to implement it for the next 10 years and so on. So then you'll see the, uh, the, the action targets grouped into three reducing the threats, meeting needs of people, and then the tools and solutions. These have been, uh, you know, we have discussed them a number of times, but just to tell you that those uh, targets dealing with reducing threats were mainly based on the outcomes of the IP-based report, but what I think uh, now considering how we bring on board G GBO5, because we had and it was also agreed in uh, during COP14 that this framework should be science-based as much as possible. So I'll not explain a lot of this. If you have questions, we can always unpack for you what each of those uh, targets are on, but there are 20 of them in total. 
that covers almost everything that I've been talking about here. Um, let's go to the next one. So there are, of course, upcoming meetings. And um, if we had our previous plan implemented according to the way it was thought, today, the framework will already be in place and perhaps we'll be seeing how we kickstart implementation. Unfortunately, 2020 didn't go as planned due to what most of you know now. So already now we are thinking of 2021, what's going to happen? And we need prayers here because um, we see a lot of, um, you know, still challenges coming up with the pandemic, but we are going to be having informal session for Substar in Feb this year, that will be followed by the one on SBI. And then around well, May there, we, we are planning to have the physical meetings. That is for Substar and SBI. And after that, we should then draft, come up with draft one, which goes to the third meeting of the working group. That is provisionally around maybe you talk of July, August this year. And then following that meeting of the, like actually it's the last meeting of the working group, then we should be able to prepare the final draft of the post 2020, which then will go to COP, uh, hopefully somewhere in November. We don't know, but this is the planning right now. And they are only indicative I do not yet, uh, I would say, represent a decision because this pandemic has made things to be so fluid, you cannot be so sure. But we still, we are trying our best to make sure that we have some kind of uh, timelines we are, we are thinking through. But of course, in between those meetings, you can see the, the arrows below, um, uh, just the last slide below there, you'll see that we still have some informal sessions that we are going to always be having. So, this is how we are planning. We, we need just prayers so that this year becomes the year that the framework eventually is adopted and we can start putting our energies into implementation. It's already two years of consultation. And by the time it is adopted, it might be three years or more. So thank you very much. I think this is it. If we could go to the next slide, which is, I think, the very last one. So that is it, that um, COP15 will take place in Kunming, China. The time frame is, of course, you'll be notified immediately. It is uh, confirmed. So I think that is it from us. We would wait to hear more from you in terms of questions or feedback, and then we can explain where needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Coaches, for that very informative presentation. And dear participants, we will now take a bit time to respond to any questions that you may have. In order to ask a question, please, as I said before, please use the question window located on the right on the screen. And when asking a question, please also remember to include your name and party or organization. So see if we have any questions. Secretariat, if you can see if we have any questions already now. So, so yeah, there's there's one question right now, but it um so I'll, I'll read it out. Um, and the question is, are there any official CBD documents which explain why decades efforts did not produce expected results? So, um, that's perhaps not a question to the, the co-chair so much, but um, um. If I may, just to, to help respond to that, um, I would point um, you towards the fifth edition of the Global Biodiversity Outlook, uh, amongst other things, which talks about um, some of the limitations that have been encountered. Um, similarly, there's a, um, under agenda item three, the documents that have been prepared for that, which are reviewing progress and implementation of the strategic plan and the convention more generally help to address that point. Um, now there's um, another um, question, which is um, given the current uh, inequities in vaccine access, 
um, where many developing countries are not expected to be able to roll out vaccines widely in 2022, isn't the tentative meeting timeline ambitious? What contingency plans are in place? Could physical meetings not, it should admit physical meetings not be able to happen. Um, and I suppose that's perhaps a question for Charlotte and perhaps Jyoti and the um, executive secretary or anyone else who would like to, to respond. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. Well, I can start and maybe Secretary can, can also help. Uh, I think that, uh, well, as already underlined, is very indicative timeline right now. What we know is that we will do have informal meetings of, of Substance SBI in February, in March. And after that, it will be, of course, a discussion and uh, assessment in the COP Bureau about how to continue. So it's, um, well, there is, of course, as said, it's very un much that is uncertain right now, but I hope maybe the, somebody from the Secretariat duty or somebody else could maybe say a little more about plans and scenarios ahead. Thank you so much. Um, actually, you have said um, all that really needs to be said. We are keeping the timelines under um, under review all the time, as is the Bureau, after each and every meeting that we have, like we did the virtual meeting in September, um, the, the virtual meeting we had in December, and the, uh, the informal meetings of SUPSA and SPI that we will have in 7 March. Uh, the Bureau will um, review, the, uh, review the results and lessons from these, and then we will make plans. However, if we are to have uh, COP this year, then we have to um, find ways and plans and means to have um, at least the subsidiary body meetings and the meetings of the working group on um, post-2020, um, sometime um, at least nine weeks before the, before the uh, COP. Uh, as you know, because of the inter intersessional a uh, process where we are supposed to put up documents six weeks in advance. Uh, we, uh, we at least need three weeks between um, each. Uh, we need three weeks to, pre uh, to prepare the documents at least and get them edited and translated so that they are available six weeks ahead of, uh, ahead of time. So we need nine weeks minimum um, to get anything done, uh, to get you know the next set of documents done. So. Um, please just keep uh, keep uh, checking our website and the notifications we send. And as I said, we are keeping this under review all the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I, could I touch something on question that, that question which was asked uh, regarding uh, why or contribute to it? Why decades don't seem to produce? Yeah, please results. go ahead. Uh, please go yeah, ahead. within the city. Yeah, I, I think I'll try to give a little bit of a background to this. Uh, from the time I got to, to the CBD, that was around 2005 or so to date. Uh, that was more or less the time when a few years after that, the first strategic plan, of course, the current IH by the West target, which is in it, was adopted in 2010. But prior to that, there was then, and I didn't participate in that then, but there was the 2010 biodiversity target. That also was not achieved. I think it was some discussion that happened around 2002 maybe. And um, so there was that proposal to, by 2010 to have taken action actually to reduce loss of biodiversity. 2020, another 10 years and nothing much. I think this is why this participants are raising that. And now we are talking of next 30 years. From what I saw uh, with the, especially this current strategic plan, uh, which of course ended last year, there are a number of things that needed to have been already in place at the same time that that strategic plan was adopted. One was the issue of resource mobilization or resources for implementation. So the framework was just adopted. And I think with the understanding that resources would be there for implementing it, but that was not the case. So many years then, there were negotiations at COP on resource mobilization for implementing that strategic plan. And often the agreement was not being reached easily. So that affected implementation immensely. Then capacity building, 
most of those targets needed capacity, especially at the national level. So at the time we were adopting it, the necessary capacity should have been built at the national level for that to happen. Again, by the time we are implementing, we were hoping to be implementing it, there were lots and lots of discussion on capacity building for implementing the strategy. So that was the other hurdle. Then the other thing was about um, the use of the indicators for reporting on progress of implementation. Again, the strategic plan was adopted without the indicators in place. And we started again discussing which indicators are we going to use? What are, how are we going to report? Now that was agreed in 2016, when the framework is now left just about four years for it to end. You can see those challenges. And then of course that affected without indicate, proper indicators in place, it means even reporting per se became a problem to, 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 to this uh, implementing the, the strategic plan. Perhaps the last one was updating and uh, aligning the NBSAPs. You see the, the NBSAPs were updated after the strategic plan was uh, adopted. You expect that to happen because this, uh, 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 targets are to be domesticated at a national level. Now that too on average about five years. So you're talking of from 2021 to around 2015, 2016, that the parties were in the processes of updating, aligning NBSAPs. Now a half of those years for that matter therefore went into process issues. So going forward in the post 2020, having seen those lessons, there are certain, uh, I think, uh, interventions we are trying to, to do so that uh, these issues are done in tandem with the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. So the issues of um, resource mobilization, capacity building, the indicators, all these, our hope is that they are all going to be handled in tandem so that by the time we go uh, into adopting this framework, perhaps the capacity building part of it, the indicators, we even have the monitoring framework now in place we should be accompanying this framework. So those ones are supposed to be in place so that we don't repeat the other lessons of this current strategic plan. But you've also seen when I, when I was just telling you about the goal D on the means of implementation. Our understanding then was by that last year, sorry, yeah, last year, that the framework would have been adopted in October. And then we take about two years to see whether resources are in place to um, implement the framework so that by 2022 we have this framework uh, you know fully resourced for the for the first 10 years now that is what we are thinking through but also for the NBSA, we are thinking that we should be much more um, creative here and see whether the time frame could be shorter but also see how implementation could still start um, even when we are trying to align those uh, you know um, the adopted framework to our NBSAP. So these are some of the ways we're trying to see that the next 10 years is not wasted. Honestly, I do agree with the participant that, you know, to lose another 10 years, say by 2030, just another 10 years gone like that, loss of biodiversity not in any way tackled, the global community will continue to be under risk. So let's work hard and see how things could be done differently in the post-2020. Maybe go share me something, thank you. Thank you, Francis. And I understand maybe, Basile, you so, would like to add something to this point? Yeah, so very quickly, I think the, 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 the notion, I think Francis did a good job at describing the, and, and I, I would like to underline uh, his points, but to add to it, I think the work you're gonna be doing in SBI is gonna be very important for that. Having, having those more transparent, precise, measurable, uh, system that enable us to see and track how we're making progress is going to be an essential part. And and what I what I what I understand is that parties are looking for that advice, and 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 that's going to be very important. I know there is a number of other questions. Uh, one that was pointed to me is how are we going to be dealing with uh, genetic uh, diversity in the framework? Um, Remember that what we've done with the updated framework is to reflect the conversation that took place in Rome, nothing else. So there was not a time where we could be adding new elements coming from, from good suggestion from, from outside. That will come 
with Substar and SBI. So it is going to be very important that if you have a recommendation and something that needs to be factored in, you, you use the opportunity of SBI and Substar, and then we can take it on board inside the drafting of uh, draft one. So that's a, an important point. I also see a comment there about uh, what should be the, the focus of the, the, the framework and, and whether we need to be ambitious or we need to be uh, realistic. We have a vision and, and we have agreed, we've agreed at COP14 that that vision would be the guiding light or the, the end point. And if we want to, um, to be successful and, and, and reach that vision, we're going to need to be ambitious. And that's part of the work that your, your, the, the sister committee of this one, SEPSTA, will be looking at us and looking whether the, uh, the discussion, whether the measures, the type of, of uh, targets, et cetera, enable to reach that vision. So uh, that's, a, that's a fundamental point or, or a fundamental design consideration in the new system. So those are a couple, but maybe Kieran is better than me at uh, doing the summary of those questions. Thank you. Kieran, how many, yes. how much time um, do so we, we have? We have, we have a few more questions. So um, I'll take the next one, um, which is, um, a, um, sorry, I just lost my window, um, which is a question about um, the organization of work for the informal meetings. Um, so someone would like to have a bit more information on the informal sessions of Substa and SBI. Um, and relatedly, um, are, is the intention to, to do any sort of revisions of the documents um, following those, those sessions. So um, I believe, you know, Charlotte or perhaps Jyoti would like to respond to that. Charlotte? Shall I, yes, maybe, maybe I, I can start on that. Well, we, we will have um, our plan. We will have, uh, first I will say, uh, I have proposed um, a draft organization of work for the informal session of SBI that, <clears throat> sorry, I will uh, present it to the COP Bureau and we will have a meeting at the COP Bureau uh, 25th of January and they, and I um, will see what kind of guidance the COP Bureau will give me. But my idea is that we go through all, my hope is we have some um, possibility to give comments on all uh, SBI agenda items. Um, and that, of course, will be a possibility to have a, a like a, even if it's an informal meeting, it's also some kind of possibility to have some kind of first statements or first readings of, of all documents. And, um, and we'll see, and hopefully we'll have time to go through all the agenda items, even if we have 12 substantive agenda items. It is my, my plan. Uh, and then, as I understand, the question is what will happen then? Uh, and Yes, that's of course a good question. And maybe Secretary can help me, but uh, as, as I said before, we will have, a, it's planned also to have some kind of assessment after the informal meetings. Um, and this, I of course intend to capture the, the content of the discussions so we can make use of them. Uh, maybe Jyoti, if you can add something on this. Yes, um, so the intent of the informal session is just again to try out uh, how the virtual sessions uh, work. There will be no negotiations or decisions from this uh, session. Uh, so the documents will not be changed. When we open the formal session of SBI, everything will be exactly the same as it is at the time of the informal session. It is only after each agenda item has been opened up during uh, the formal session of the SBI that a CRP will be prepared. Um, so there will be no changes in the document between um, the informal session and the formal session and no negotiations and no decisions. Um, this is the decision of the Bureau and, uh, and parties, so um, that is what we will adhere to. I hope this answers the uh, question. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti. Um, maybe on genetic diversity? Yes, Francis. Charlotte? Yeah. Yeah, on, on genetic uh, diversity, I think as Koche has said, um, most of these issues, perhaps as we 
continue to work on this uh, framework. There's still time for that, especially maybe at the third meeting of the working group, depending on what is come through and even as such, perhaps. We could see how to keep improving these targets. But um, in general, some of these could be already catered for, maybe indirectly also in some of the targets, like if you look at um, target three, currently, which says uh, by 2030, ensure active management actions to enable wild species of fauna and flora recovery and conservation. So somewhere might just be implied, but maybe the word genetic diversity might not be coming out very clearly. But if we get guidance, as co-chair said, we can always see how to move about in, in that. But most of these tend to be broad, these, these targets to capture some of these issues. Thank you very much. I think that uh, is it still more questions, Secretariat, or maybe we need to continue so, our session? Um, come... So there are um, a, a number of um, people have asked if we'll be sharing presentations um, after the webinar, and we will, um, and this session is also being recorded, so there'll be a, a good record of that. Um, perhaps just one last um, question, and then perhaps I'd suggest in the interest of time we should move on, but um, the question is, has it been decided that official meetings, um, so the SBI meetings or the open-ended working group, will happen in person um, and and not virtually, even if that means COP15 has to be next year? So I, I think, um, Charlotte, you already sort of, and, and, and Basil, you already addressed this to a certain extent um, in your opening remarks, but I'm not sure if there's anything else that you'd like to add um, on that point. And then I would suggest in the interest of time that we, we move on. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, I, I think we, we already comment on that. I mean, what we know is that uh, it's, it is uh, assessment done all the time by the COP Bureau, and we, we know we'll have informal meetings, but it's very important that we do also stepwise approach. We will do an assessment of the informal meetings of SBI and SUPS, and then we'll see. That's the only answer we, I think we can give. But, uh, as, but of course, you can have scenarios and plan you need to of course, do some kind of plans, but we all know by now that plans have to change all the time. So we have to, to live in this uncertainty. But uh, I think that uh, we'll, maybe we can come back later if, if we have more time. We will have a, 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 another possibility to, to raise questions later on in this uh, webinar. So I will now like to move on to the next part of our session. And uh, and thank you again, dear Basil and Francis, for your presentation. Very helpful indeed, as always. I would like also to provide uh, an overview of my expectation from SBI for Agenda Item 5. And I have, can I have received some questions already on this. So before the Secretary provides us with an overview of a documentation prepared for this agenda item, I would like to take some time to clarify how I propose to treat agenda item five during both the informal and formal meeting of SBI. And now I think we should have another presentation. Um, yes, sorry, Charlotte. Perhaps you want to go ahead. I'm just having some technical issues with my um, okay. with my uh, computer, and I'll I'll get the slides up as soon as I can. Okay, thank you. Okay, as you know, uh, many issues that will be considered by SBI free are directly relevant to the development of a post 2020 global biodiversity framework. Oh, here's the presentation. Thank you. In particular, I, it is the discussions on the agenda items 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11. Well, it's the majority of our agenda items are particularly important. And given these interconnections and SBI freeze heavy agenda item, and in order to avoid parallel discussions, my suggestion is that issues related to post-2020 global biodiversity framework related to 
the to these agenda items will be considered under respective agenda item and not under agenda item five. And to make an example, if if you have issues related to resource mobilization for the post fundamentally good diversity framework, it should be addressed under agenda item six on resource mobilization and not under agenda item five. And similarly, issues related to reporting, assessment, and review should be discussed under agenda item nine and not under agenda item five. To further facilitate the consideration of issues related to the development of a post-2020 global biodiversity framework, the co-chairs of the Open Energy Working Group have identified a set of questions for which they would like to have input of SBI. And these questions, which are set out in Annex document CBD slash SBI slash three slash four, are likely to be addressed naturally during the course of the discussions on the respective agenda items. But however, parties may wish to bear them in mind during the deliberations. And uh, a bit later in, in our session today, the co-chairs will also provide us with more information on the questions in the Annex. So next slide, please. And given this, my suggestion in that discussion under agenda item five should focus on issues not covered by another agenda item and or general overarching or cross-cutting issues as well as issues related to a post-2020 implementation plan and capacity building action plan for the Katashina protocol on biosafety, the gender plan of action for a post-2020 global period, communications for post-2020 global biodiversity framework, and proposals for the date, venue, and periodicity of upcoming meetings. So let us now turn to the presentations on the documentation for agenda item five. And we will have three, document, uh, three presentations. The following these will have also another possibility to answer any questions you may have through the question window. Uh, and you can, of course, if you have questions already now, you can feel free to put the questions already now in the chat. And when asking a question, please remember to include your name and country or organization affiliation in order to help us address the questions more effectively. So we will now have a presentation on the documentation. So Secretary, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, so as um, was just described in the next few minutes, I'm just going to quickly go through the documentation that's been prepared for this agenda item. So there are three sort of main mandates for um, this work. The, the first stems from decision 1434, where the COP set out the process for developing the post-2020 framework. Um, and you know, indicated that the subsidiary body should play an important role in that process. Then subsequently in um, working group recommendation one and two, um, there was further specif specificity provided to the expected role um, and contributions of SBI. So these, this, recommend, this uh, decision and two recommendations provide the overarching context for um, this agenda item. With regards to the specific documentation, um, there's essentially four uh, pre-session documents which have been prepared. Um, the first one, um, three slash four, provides an overview of the post-2020 framework process and sets out um, the, some of the main considerations with regards to that, as well as it's the document that contains the draft recommendation for the consideration of SBI. This main document is in turn supported by two addendum documents. So one looking at communications and the other looking at a um, the gender plan of action. And then lastly, there's a, an additional document which looks at the implementation plan and capacity building plan, um, action plan for the Cartagena protocol. And this document also contains a draft recommendation um, for the further consideration um, by the SBI and ultimately by the, the COP MOP. So the, the second part of the document um, really just provides a, a, an overview of the different consultations, the different formal processes that have gone into the post-2020 framework so far, um, and includes a lot of 
um, links to the various reports of those sessions. So it's really intended to provide um, an easy spot to access sort of the, the relevant consultations and the information stemming from those. Um, the next part of the document identifies the various links to the other related agenda items. So um, as the FBI chair described, there's a lot of agenda items on the agenda for SBI, which relate to the post-2020 framework. Um, however, the suggestion is that these issues be addressed under the respective agenda items and not necessarily under agenda item five. Um, and as the SBI chair noted, and as we'll hear a bit later from the two co-chairs from the working group, there's also an annex which is attached to this document, which sets out some, some issues or questions that the SBI may wish to consider as it looks at um, the development of the post-2020 framework as it relates to these other agenda items. The next part of the document um, refers to the, the, looks at the links between the post-2020 framework and the Cartagena protocol. Um, and there are two specific decisions related to that. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this because my, my colleague a bit later will provide a more um, substantive presentation on post-2020 as it relates to the, the Cartagena protocol. The next section of the document um, looks at other issues related to the development of the post-2020 framework. And here there are, are two issues in particular. Um, one is the follow-up to the gender plan of action. So as you may recall, the current gender plan of action um, had, a, had an endpoint of 2020. So there needs to be a decision or consideration rather of, of what to do um, sort of in the coming period. And similarly, there's the issue of communications for the post-2020 framework and, and what those should look like. So both of these issues are, are, will be addressed in the addendums that I, I mentioned earlier. Lastly, the, the last part of the document sets up some considerations regarding the date, venue, and periodicity of future meetings. Um, so as you'll know, there's a number of issues that need to be taken into account um, in, in this discussion. So one is um, decision 1333, which is a, a previous decision of the COP on the date and venue and periodicity of future meetings. But in addition, you know, the, the timing for future meetings is going to need to be informed by discussions happening under the FBI on mechanisms for reporting and assessment, for example, but also whatever other processes are established to further operate, operationalize the framework and anything that's um, adopted or uh, agreed as part of the pro pro protocols. And of course, decisions around date and periodicity will also need to take into account the evolving situation with COVID-19. So the, the suggestion in the document at this stage is that um, the FBI may wish to have a discussion on these and then request the executive secretary to go back um, and prepare a more detailed proposal for the consideration of COP15 when hopefully the situation is a bit more um, clear and stable. Um, so th that's, that's it for, for my presentation. It's, as I said, it's, it was quite short and it's just really intended to provide an overview of the main pre-session document that's been prepared for this agenda item. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Secretary. It's, 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 for that presentation is very helpful uh, to have us in the background. And I would now like to invite the co-chairs of the post-2020 framework, Basil and Francis, to provide us with more information on the annex of document CBD slash SPI slash free slash four. The annex I already mentioned about. So, Thank you. Co-chairs, you have the floor. Just give me a second. Yeah, now I can see it. Okay. All right. Um, th thank you. And then as mentioned earlier, when we started to work with, uh, with uh, Charlotte and the Secretariat team in terms of understanding and defining how we will do the interface between our work in terms of drafting the the framework. We started by by drafting a list of points, and and at some point it became evident that the easiest way to uh, to ensure that we we get the elements we were looking for for the drafting was to draft a a, uh, a number of of, uh, of questions. So basically, uh, we 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 went through that exercise and and started to to draft. And and as uh, as mentioned. Uh, I think the, the approach chosen by Charlotte of not repeating the discussion is the most efficient one. So, so we don't need to have, and it would be silly to have a, a duplicate of uh, the, the conversation. 
What we just need to know is that you have uh, something like a checklist that when you have your discussion and you've gone to the through an item, you can go back to your checklist and make sure that the elements were considered. I we don't uh, want to imply that you need absolutely to respond to each and every one of them, but what we felt it was useful for you to add that list and and to have a conscious decision on whether you want or don't want to to consider that. And and basically what uh, we're going to have at the end is a way to ensure that everything was properly uh, considered. So um we grouped the question and we've numbered them and, and that was mainly for us in terms of how we went through the review of them and their group around the, the agenda item that you're, you're going to be using. So uh, very quickly, we're going we're gonna to try to go through them um, uh, and then Francis will take over at some point. The first one is on resource mobilization. And then we try to divide uh, according to some teams or, or elements, needs, uh, savings that could be done, the source of funds, and then this notion of a finance, finance plan. And you will see for needs, uh, there is two aspects to it. There is the cost of the implementation of the global biodiversity framework, and then there is the cost of inaction. So, so if we don't do anything, um, what will that cost to, to our society? Then the second one is on savings and, and how we can, and you will remember the discussion we had at the uh, resource mobilization uh, thematic consultation, uh, reducing cost was an important aspect. Then the source of fund, and, and, and we go through the, the, the various elements and, and repurposing of existing subsidies and incentives is essentially is a very important one. And, philanthropy, business, national budget, development assistance, uh, the role of the GBF and the role of other funds. Then and moving to the finance plan, and, and those are relatively open questions because the concept is there, but we, we, we don't have a decision yet from, from, from the parties and we're looking for your advice. So what should they be? How, what level of detail should they be mandatory? And then and, and what are the roles? So then I'll go to the next one on capacity building. Um, then here you get capacity building and development, knowledge generation, and technical scientific cooperation, technology transfers and innovation. I've, we've tried to simplify the language for the purpose of this presentation, but you have in the annex the full language that is uh, more appropriate for you to work on. Global capacity building is the best tool. Uh, strategies, is it the best tool? So are, are we shaping ourselves with the best element to capture uh, those elements? National conditions and needs, how are they determined and, and communicated? Traditional knowledge, uh, what, are, what are the process needed? It's very uneven across the, across the various countries. Process for the further development of biological information. And under the rubric of technical and scientific co co uh, cooperation, there is a lot there. And, 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 and I think uh, you see that as one question or, or maybe a couple in the, in, under 4.1, but uh, you should uh, probably spend a little bit of time in trying to figure out how the, the cooperation, technology transfer and innovation is done. How do we support it? What are the capacity in developing countries? And, and how uh, the, 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 the parties are working with each other and with partners. So with that, I'll pass the floor on to Francis, who will, which, who will take you through the next few slides. Francis, over to you. Thank you, uh, co-chair. Um, yeah, I'll tackle the one. Uh, this will be what is relevant for agenda item nine. And some of the things we are discussing is, uh, here is the issue of transparency and responsibility. Um, this also will perhaps still re-echo some of the things we said earlier, what was affecting the implementation of the current um, strategic plan or the plan that has just ended last year. But uh, in terms of uh, this topic, how then do we ensure that um, there is transparency and that people are really responsible for what they should be taking action on for all stakeholders. So this is a framework that will not only need to be adopted, but people should then take up their responsibilities when it comes to implementing the framework. And then 
This is a framework, as we said, for all. It brings on board many other UN conventions, UNFC, Triple C, you're talking about one on land degradation, societies, you're talking about CMS, Ramsar. There are many, I cannot list all of them. How are they going to be uh, reporting or supporting your reporting? Because they also have their own uh, perhaps uh, reporting framework, but and indicators. How are we going to bring all this together? And then for the business community, we are saying this time around we want business to be part of this framework. But how then do they report? And what about the subnational governments? How are they going to report? Is it through the main national governments? Or, or, or we are thinking of any other way of doing that. About the NBSAP, like I explained later, this is going to be, and it was agreed, I think already, if not agreed, but there is the understanding that the NBSAP is still going to be a very important tool for advancing implementation of this post 2021 adopted. So then the question comes here, are the NBSAP still the basis for the national plans? What kind of instrument do we need to facilitate the, com the commitments at the national level? Is that the NBSAP itself? What is the role of NBSAP in this? We are there going to be commitments when it comes to this post-2020. So is the NBSAP going to be the one that helps us on that? And how often are we going to be um, updating those NBSAPs? Then are there changes that we need to do in the NBSAPs themselves? And if so, then we are talking about financial resources, which will be timely for really doing this kind of work. We said already that um, the, the, the aligning in the first strategic plan took five years because even getting the resources to do that took like two years, then a review to another three years. So you see, these are things now we have to do. It should be how are the resources going to be made available timely, but also should be adequate for that. And then must the end be subject include all the relevant targets from the post-2020 framework? If so, how do we ensure this and how and who decides what is relevant? You know, if you say you're only taking up some few and not all, how do you reach at that? Then must NB subs reflect the, the headline indicators at the national level? This that is the indicator that all parties, all stakeholders will be requested to report on, especially parties. So should it be reflected in our NB subs? Can countries use their own national indicators? or only indicators agreed by the conference of the parties. That's the other thing you need to do. The parties have the necessary capacity and resources to report on those mandatory indicators. This is another one. Do they have it? We need to be very transparent here. How can NBSAPs ensure, how can we ensure that NBSAPs are developed expeditiously? You know, what is the time frame to minimize delays? And then how can we be benefit from synergies? by integrating with the other plans. And um, next slide, which is on, uh, still continuing with this topic. So this is about, if we go to the next one, 5.3. Yeah, there we go. So still continuing with the same. It is, please before that, yeah, that one. What is the process or modalities for national reporting? Reporting is one of the areas we need to be addressing seriously in the post 2020, because sometimes you find other parties are not able to report on time, others report much later. So what is causing all that and how do we need to address them? How should countries report on their commitments or actions listed in their national plans? Should reports cover all actions and commitments or a subset? Because all those targets that will be agreed at national level, have got implication or resource envelope and even capacities, skilled personnel and others to do that kind of work. So are they going to repeat reporting on all those or some or a subset? Should different types of information be reported at different times or frequencies? So are we going to have interim reports? And then finally you have the full reports at some point. How do we ensure that reports are provided according to the agreed schedule? Again, this is what I was saying. If it is, you are supposed to be submitting in 2023, maybe April or June, and reports are coming 
two years after that, they have reported all right, but it is late. So how do we ensure that it is done on time? How then could the reports of the different processes be harmonized? We are talking about those other UN uh, agencies that at national level, we know they work together. We are talking about also other reporting requirements this time around that might come for the convention, for the Cartagena protocol and for the Nagoya protocol. How are we going to synchronize all this? Can we have one reporting format, template that handles all that, to reduce on the reporting fatigue? Because you've just finished the, six, the one for the CBD, shortly you go the one for Nagoya, shortly you go the one for Cartagena protocol, going back to the same stakeholders, you fatigue yourself and the stakeholders as well. What is the role of the, the IP base, you know, in, in this reporting? Like there in any part where the gaps that we expect them to, to, to address. How do we ensure that the review system ensures learning, transparency, and adaptation? And um, should national reports be reviewed for their conformity to guidelines as agreed by the parties? And if so, what are the modalities for this? You know, there, there has been some peer review that has taken place. It is interesting that um, even when uh, peer review pro the peer review process was requested, you'll find that not many parties really wanted to, to be peer reviewed. What was causing that? What was really the underlying cause for parties or not coming up very fast to participate in the peer review process? What kind of data should be used and what is the role of data collected by non-state actors, non, those non-businesses and so forth? Data collection. How that is that going to be done? I think that is it, that those are the questions we have tried so that you reflect on them when you're on some of these agenda items and you see whether it guides you to you know, have much concrete discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, co-chairs of that presentation. And as I said before, my plan is that these questions which are set out in this annex are likely to be addressed naturally during the course of a discussion on respective agenda items. So you keep that, them in mind. Thank you very much. We have one more presentation and I would now like to invite the Secretariat to provide us with information related to the post-2020 implementation plan and capacity building action plan for the Katarina protocol on biosafety. So Secretariat, you have the floor. Yes, I can see the presentation. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to all of you. Um, in this presentation, uh, document CBD slash SBI slash three slash 18 uh, on the post 2020 implementation plan and capacity building action plan for the Cartagena protocol biosafety will be introduced. The um, document consists of four sections. The draft implementation plan and capacity building action plan itself are provided in the annex. I will be providing a, a brief summary of each of these sections in this presentation. Section one of the document provides an introduction and background to the development uh, process of the implementation plan and capacity building action plan. In decision uh, CP97, the meeting of the parties to the Cartagena protocol decided to develop a specific post-2020 implementation plan for the Cartagena protocol that is anchored in and complementary to the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And it requested the executive secretary to facilitate the development of its elements. The meeting of the parties decided that the implementation plan would be developed as an implementation tool, maintaining relevant elements of the strategic plan for the, uh, the protocol strategic plan for the period 2011 to 2020, while including new elements, ensuring flexibility to account for developments during the implementation period, and comprising simple and measurable indicators. In its decision CP93, the meeting of the parties acknowledged the need for a specific action plan for capacity building that is aligned with the implementation plan and complementary to the long-term strategic framework for 
capacity development beyond 2020. Now, for the development of both plans, the meeting of the parties outlined an extensive consultation process, uh, including the consideration of the implementation plan and the capacity building action plan by the subsidiary body on implementation at its uh, third meeting. Section two of the document <clears throat> summarizes the development process of the implementation plan and the capacity building action plan. <clears throat> Parties and observers were invited uh, to submit views on um, the structure and the content of the implementation plan and on possible elements of the capacity building action plan. These submissions were due in April 2019. On the basis of the um, submissions uh, received and in accordance with uh, guidance provided by the meeting of the parties, the Secretariat developed the first draft of the implementation plan. In July 2019, open-ended discussions were convened in which the submissions received as well as the first draft of the implementation plan were considered. Taking into account the input provided through the open-ended online discussions, the Secretariat prepared an update of the first draft of the implementation plan, which was reviewed by the liaison group on the Cartagena Protocol at its 13th meeting, which was held in October 2019. The liaison group at that meeting also considered the first draft of the Capacity Building Action Plan, which had been prepared <clears throat> on the basis of submissions received and taking into consideration guidance provided by the meeting of the parties. Based on the input provided by the liaison group, the Secretariat updated the draft implementation plan and capacity building action plan and organized the peer review of the documents. The peer review took place from December 2019 until January 2020. The advice provided by the liaison group was used to finalize the draft implementation plan and capacity building action plan. Um, and then the documents were uh, made available to the subsidiary body on implementation for consideration at its third meeting. Throughout the development process, there was a very good level of response and engagement from parties and from observers. Uh, section three of the document describes linkages between the implementation plan and the capacity building action plan on the one hand, and the global biodiversity framework and related processes on the other. The meeting of the parties in its decision CP9-7 stressed the importance of including biosafety in the global biodiversity framework and it requested the liaison group on the Cartagena Protocol to contribute to the development of the relevant elements in consultation with the co-chairs of the Open Ended Working Group. The basis of the original text of the biosafety component that was included in the zero draft of the Global Biodiversity Framework uh, was developed by the liaison group and handed over to the co-chairs of the Open Ended Working Group for inclusion in the zero draft. That proposal took into consideration submissions received input provided the global thematic consultation on biosafety and considered the relevant provisions on biosafety of the convention. In the current draft of the global biodiversity framework, biosafety is addressed in target 16. Its inclusion in the global biodiversity framework underlines the linkage uh, between biosafety and biodiversity, but also with wider frameworks, including the sustainable development goals. The inclusion of biosafety in the global biodiversity framework uh, may facilitate the implementation of the, of the Cartagena Protocol, which can in turn contribute to reaching the objectives of the Convention and the targets of the Global Biodiversity Framework. The uh, meeting of the parties stressed the importance of developing the implementation plan and the capacity building action plan in a way that is complementary to the Global Biodiversity Framework and to the long-term strategic framework for capacity development. The current draft implementation plan and capacity building action plan rely on and are linked with components of the global biodiversity framework and are complementary to general aspects of capacity building addressed in the long-term strategic framework for capacity development. <clears throat> um, section four of the document contains a draft recommendation. The subsidiary body is invited um, to review the draft implementation plan and capacity building action plan as provided in the annex of the document and to make a recommendation to the meeting of the parties for consideration at its 10th meeting. The draft recommendation is provided which uh, captures elements related to both the implementation plan and the capacity building action plan as the plans are presented alongside one another in the same document. 
Additional elements for the recommendation may be developed as part of discussions on the global biodiversity framework under other parts of item five, but also as part of deliberations under other agenda items, in particular at item seven, as it relates to capacity building. These additional elements can be added to the draft recommendation. So turning to the annex of the document, uh, you will find the draft implementation plan and capacity building action plan. There is an introductory text addressing the purpose of the implementation plan and capacity building action plan um, and uh, their structure, the linkage with the global biodiversity framework and the long-term strategic framework for capacity development, evaluation and review, priorities and programming, and other elements. Following this narrative, an appendix contains a detailed uh, tabular structure containing elements related to the implementation plan and the capacity building action plan. For the implementation plan, it provides goals, objectives, indicators, and outcomes. For the capacity building action plan, it provides key areas for capacity building and capacity building activities for all goals. The implementation plan and capacity building action plan are presented alongside one another to show alignment and to avoid duplication. The implementation plan is uh, directed primarily at parties, but it is acknowledged that a wide range of stakeholders have an important role in implementation and in capacity building. The table presented in the appendix is divided into two sections. Um, a section A, areas for implementation, contains key elements for implementation. Section B provides elements related to creating an enabling environment for implementation. These are cross-cutting elements intended to support implementation. The objectives of the implementation plan follow the main provisions of the protocol, reflecting the protocol's key obligations as well as other provisions. For all goals of the implementation plan, key areas for capacity building and capacity building activ activities are provided. The list of capacity building activities are examples of suggested activities. The activities provided are not exhaustive. And this was done in the understanding that capacity development should be modeled according to national needs, circumstances, and priorities, and that planning is needed to develop capacity building activities that fit these particular domestic needs, and that a one-size-fits-all approach for capacity building would not be suitable for all parties. Um, it, as it may be hard to visualize the description of the appendix, this slide is meant to give you an idea of what the tabular structure looks like. So a snapshot is provided of the goal related to functional national biosafety frameworks, uh, goal one. You see that a description of the goal is provided at the left, followed by a number of objectives in the second column, which is followed by indicators in column three and an outcome description in column four. So these first four columns are related to the implementation plan. The uh, two last columns provide key areas for capacity building and capacity building activities. Those relate to the capacity building action plan. For all the goals uh, that are summarized here, uh, on this slide, uh, similar detail is provided further down in the table, uh, divided in goals related to areas for implementation, so the first 10, and in goals related to creating an enabling environment, the last four. The descriptions of the goals provided here is, a, is an abbreviation in the interest of space, uh, and the complete wording is, uh, is, is, uh, is obviously uh, uh, provided in a document. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Secretariat, for that presentation. And that was our final presentation. So let us now address any questions that you may have on all three presentations. And uh, I remind you that to ask a question, you need to enter them in the question box at the right of your screens. And when asking a question, please indicate your name and your party or organization affiliation so we can better manage the questions. And I think we already have some questions. Secretariat, maybe you can guide us through. 
Yes, certainly. So um, there's a number of questions um, related to agenda item nine. So um, a question noting that some NBSAPs have a period that end after 2020. Um, are these countries to revise their NBSAPs to be in line with the post-2020 framework? Um, there's also a question with regards um, to the, the, the table in document three slash four in the annex um, with regards to what is it meant by um, mandatory reporting. So the, does that imply legally bind, that does that imply a legally binding framework? Um, so I'm not sure if either the SBI chair or the co-chairs would like to address either of these points, but I should also note that agenda item nine will have a, its own webinar on Thursday and that some of these issues will be explored in greater detail. So um, if participants are particularly interested in those issues, they may wish to join the agenda, um, the webinar on Thursday where these issues will be further explored. Yes, thank you, Secretary. Yes, uh, I was just about to say that the webinar on Thursday will be a good po possibility to also have a more in depth in these issues. But uh, maybe co-chairs, if you can answer on the questions on your que on your questions in the annex, go ahead. So, so um, I see the, the particularly the, the the question about does mandatory suggest legally binding. Um, Remember, this is a list of questions, and and where where I think the, the the question that is asked to us is the start to the answer, and and I think I'm looking forward to the to the advice from this committee from SBI in terms of what that means, and and looking forward, you should be exp ex exploring um, the various level and and what they mean and what we can do under the current framework and where there is gap that should be addressed in the future. So. Um, this is not meant to imply an outcome. It is more meant to start a conversation and a discussion. And and in that sense, this is working because I can see that uh, that question is is uh, is raising the right points. So thank you very much. Yeah, um, there was a question about the NBSAPs, those that are ending in or ended uh, last year, 2020. Um, of course, a bit of challenge there, but I would also think that um, although those NBSAPs could have ended in 2020, their time frame in line with the IG targets, yet I think that um, most of the targets in those NBSAPs might have not all been achieved, and uh, therefore you, the need for those uh, implementation of those still continue as we, you know, work our way out to try to have this framework also in place as fast as we can. One thing though, uh, if you read through the updated uh, zero draft, um, you will see that we've done our best to actually bring on board a number of uh, uh, provisions or issues from the previous strategic plan. You'll find most of them are mentioned in there. So there's continuity. I would say, rather than uh, just that the other one has stopped and is not proceeding or not going ahead. There's a lot of continuity with the, the IT targets into the post-2020 as well. Thank you, Francis. Secretariat, more questions? Certainly. So um, there's also a question regarding um, sections G to I of the zero draft of the post-2020 framework. Um, and the question is, um, how, are these also going to be discussed because they're not currently um, on a, an SBI agenda uh, item? So I believe Shavata or perhaps um, Basil and Francis would like to address that point. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I can start and then who just can add. And, and what I have understood uh, is that, uh, so as has been said by the co-chairs, they want to have advice on the guidance and advice on the SBI on, on as much as possible in order for them to prepare for the next draft. So I guess that could be an opportunity to raise it if needed, but please be aware that um, it's not on the, it's not under a, a certain agenda item, um, but 
as you see, many of the questions in the annex, of course, is linked to this. So maybe the co-chairs also can explain better what kind of advice they want from the SBI on this. Thank you. Thank you. And, and that's, a, that's a question that sent me uh, searching from my documents and the various draft. And, and uh, for the, the benefit of the group, section G is about enabling condition and section I is around the outreach and communication. Mm -hmm. And um, um, th those are both important sections. I'm trying to, to recall why we did not include them in the, in the list of uh, questions. And frankly, uh, maybe Francis has a better memory than, than mine. We've, we've done that list of questions quite a while back because we wanted that to, do, to be done very early. So um, I, I don't think our intent was to block any conversation. We want advice as much as, as possible. But uh, I would like, I assume, unless Francis has a, a better memory than mine, I think I'm going to need to do some further digging to see why we did not include that at that time. So sorry, not a very good answer. Yeah, um, Kolchia, I think um, uh, on this issue, we, 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 we can still be looking at it uh, with the further discussion that will happen. But I think we we tended to focus more on where we have reached so far with the questions or drafting those guiding questions. I think we looked at the agenda item and reflected more or less what should be supporting discussion of that agenda item. So, but um, we are flexible enough. We can always continue working around this as well. That's what I could say right now. Thank you. Secretariat, more questions? Yes, so there's um, another question as it relates, um, it relates to the annex of document three slash four. Um, and the question is, um, why are agenda items seven and 11 not reflected in the, the list of questions or issues? Um, however, I, when I'm, unless I'm misunderstanding, when I, when I look at the document, I do see questions related to agenda item seven, but perhaps um, um, the two co-chairs would like to address uh, agenda item 11, which is on mainstreaming. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. And, and definitely, again, I, I'm, I'm going to be repeating the mainstreaming is an important and, uh, aspect, but as as we've, we've discussed uh, several times, do you treat mainstreaming as a cross-cutting issue that is covered in, in many parts of the document, or, <coughs> or do you treat it as a, a specific uh, agenda element? So uh, we, we've, uh, we've heard the direction to have mainstreaming as a specific uh, target, and, and there is one, and we're looking at the advice. Uh, we're looking at the advice you're gonna give us in terms of how we're gonna be able to shape these targets. But in terms of a system design, it's it's a, it's an, an idea that is quite different with uh, with uh, from from the uh, uh, the one such as planning, reporting, etc. Where where is it? You know, there is a core mandate for SBI to provide us with a design and some recommendation. So that's why we treat it a little bit differently. But uh, Francis, you may you may have more to add to that. Yeah, I think Chair will not, of course, I will not add uh, more to that. I think we are only, uh, uh, this feedback we are getting, it looks like um, the questions were expected to cover more than we initially thought. So maybe that is something that we can, uh, you know, I could name different meetings, see how we address them. Thank, thank you very much. Um, you have so many good questions. It's not easy to answer them all. Um, Secretariat, do you have more questions for us? Um, yes. So um, a question, um, and it's on a logistical issue, so I'll, I'll just read it out. Um, my question relates to organizational issues. We'll document CBD slash SBI slash 318. So this is a, the document related to the Cartagena protocol. Be individually considered under agenda item five. Um, relatedly, so would there be two sub-items? 
So one on the, the post-2020 framework and one under the Cartagena protocol. Thank you. So I, perhaps, perhaps yeah, okay, uh, okay. Th th thank you very much. It's also a very good question, of course. Um, well, the, the proposal I have now that I have a draft organization work is not that detailed yet. Um, we, is, as you say, is part of agenda item five, and uh, and uh, we, I think we have to think more about it how to how to do it in the best way. But uh, for now, we don't have that or detail in our planning. But the keep the question is very good question. Thank you very much for that. So the, um, there's also um, a number of of questions related to um, the two addendum documents. So the addendum um, one on communications for the post-2020 framework and addendum two on the gender plan of action. Um, and the question is essentially, um, when will these documents be available? So I'd like to perhaps ask uh, the secretary for SBI to respond to that one. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kiran. Uh, both the documents are, um, are prepared and should be uh, avail available very shortly on the website and def definitely before um, SBI informal starts in um, on March 8th. Thanks. Thank you very much for that assurance. So um, I have another well, I'll keep going with the questions if that's all right, Chair. Yeah, please go um, ahead. So, um, so, um, uh, so this is a question with regards to the Cartagena Protocol, um, um, and it's so I'll just I'll just read it out for the for the benefit of everyone. Um, my question is directed to the Secretariat on the implementation plan for the Cartagena Protocol. While acknowledged, um, the process thus far has uh, far on the development of the implementation plan. I think it will be beneficial for the national focal points for the Cartagena protocol to have a webinar to build momentum on the implementation plan, um, uh, unless if it's uh, already planned. So I, I suppose the, the the question is: Are there going to be any additional webinars with regards to the Cartagena protocol? So perhaps uh, Peter, you would like to address that point. Um, yes, it, uh, an additional uh, webinar has not been planned, but it, uh, it can be considered. Um, this uh, webinar obviously was um, the combination of the two, uh, the, the, two doc the Global Biodiversity Framework and the um, Post 2020 Implementation Plan and Capacity Building Action Plan are part of one agenda item at SBI. Um, and that is the reason um, why these two um, uh, these two doc or the two documents are being uh, presented here at the same time to uh, provide more clarity on how the uh, consideration of these two separate issues uh, can be done at SBI. Um, uh, at uh, in March there will be uh, an informal the informal session at SBI will be the first opportunity to um, have a uh, um, uh, a first. Uh, a, the first uh, introductory um, discussion about these agenda items and uh, including about the implementation plan and capacity building action plan. Uh, so from that perspective, the, uh, this webinar was, uh, is, is obviously meant to, to highlight how these uh, two elements uh, uh, relate to each other and, and how the discussions at SBI uh, under item five uh, will be held um, and, and, and more uh, 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 time for uh, consideration of the actual documents at SBI uh, will, will be obviously the, uh, the informal uh, SBI session. So at the moment, uh, no uh, separate webinar uh, of this kind in this series has been planned uh, for only the um, implementation planning, capacity building action plan. Um, so Continuing with the questions, I have another question related to the um, to the Cartagena Protocol, um, and I'll read it out. How will the post-2020 global biodiversity framework fully take into account the post-2020 implementation plan and capacity building action plan for the Cartagena Protocol, which has been developed through an extensive and consultative process? Can you please elaborate more on the process that will be adopted to ensure the two are complementary? So, um, yeah, the, the questions, Speaking I to, to the yeah, co-chairs, I, mean, I think. 
Yes, and 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 uh, that's important to to understand that we're trying. To, so we're trying to build a, a framework that include both the, the the convention and the two protocol, and the the negotiation process is is one the one that has been chosen by the parties one where it's negotiated together. So we should be clear that it is not because there is a negotiation or the discussion taking place in one. Um, in one uh, group that it is automatically reflected in the framework or it has to go through that process and through the uh, same process as the rest with the open-ended working group. I have full confidence that uh, the need of the protocol will be reflected because the, the uh, signatories to the protocol are the same that are sitting in the room. So clearly, and in, in uh, in terms of the the Katarina protocol, as you know, there is there is a target that is square really uh, directed at the protocol. In terms of capacity building and and all the enabling elements, I think the idea there is that we're taking uh, care of the needs of the protocol as part of the broader need of uh, the other part of the convention and the other protocol. So definitely, if there is additional uh, information and document. I encourage uh, people to uh, send them to the Secretariat so they can be posted on the written submission channel and they're they're available to be seen by parties. It is also important that at the national level the uh, protocol focal points ensure that those their negotiators are aware of uh, the need at the national level and that there is good coordination. Francis, do you want to add anything to that? I know that uh, the protocol is something that is dear to you. Well, um, I think basically you have indicated it well. Um, I, I know that um, throughout the discussion we have had so far, the issue of the Katagena protocol by technology by safety keeps coming up. And um, I know people are keen to see how this is handled. So the fact that we have the implementation plan or the capacity building plan, uh, as well means that um, we will consider that as well because as I said we want to do um, our best to make sure that most of the things that were perhaps not well addressed during the development of the previous strategic plan that this time around we handle it if you look at the current the previous strategic plan you'll find that it actually didn't mention biosafety it was silent there, you know, uh, but by safety was looked at a bit separate. But since now these uh, two conventions, uh, protocols, sorry, uh, are already mentioned in the respective targets, uh, I think these issues will be handled and uh, should should be part of the package, if I may say, of the post-2020. Thank you. Thank you very much. Secretariat, do we have more questions? Um, yeah. Yes, there's are, there are a few more. So um, per, perhaps there's been um, one or two questions related to Indigenous peoples and local communities and um, what is their role in the, the post-2020 framework? Um, how are their contributions going to be um, accounted for, um, valued um, and, and taken into, into account? Um, so Perhaps this is a question for the, the two co-chairs who, who would like to speak to that issue further. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I welcome the opportunity to be able to say a few words about this. Uh, we've been working uh, closely with the IIFB. There was a, a number of webinars uh, a few weeks ago uh, with them, and, and I think that's, that's probably our main channel to, uh, to get the, the views of uh, Indigenous people in local communities. In terms of practically what that means and, and where we see where we see it coming in, um, there is again several ways to look at that. You know, in an, I think in an ideal world, and that's a vision for the long term, you would not need a target for for IPLC. They they would be factored into every target, every goal. However, we're not in a in this ideal world yet. I think it will come, and I'm looking forward to it. And it's important to have specific language, and that is what I believe is under, if memory serves me well, under target 20. So 
Um, that does not mean that this is the only place, and 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 certainly uh, there will be lots of discussion about how do we reflect the notion of the role and participation of indigenous people and local communities in certain uh, specific targets. One that comes to mind is target two around uh, the protection and conservation of land. And, and we all are aware of uh, some of the um, uh, questions and, and challenge uh, that, that, that some people. I, I think it's gonna be very important to look at that from a lens of opportunities and from a lens of finding the appropriate solution to real issues and real problem. And not necessarily to jump to, to quick conclusion that in the end uh, may be counterproductive. I think in all of our mind, there is no doubt that uh, implementing the, the frameworks can only be successful with the full participation of indigenous people and local communities based on, on local circumstances. So uh, looking forward to, again, to, to encourage people to have conversation at the national level and engage with their negotiators and their CBD focal points to make sure that their views are reflected and, and uh, also to engage in the discussion that are coming up. So Francis, you may want to add something to that. I, I think you've touched all across the board. Because uh, I wanted just, I wanted to supplement uh, what you're saying with uh, the involvement of the IPLCs at the national level, but you've said that as well. But that is one area that I think um, we, we should be looking at. Even if we make effort at the global level, like Goche has said, if you look at target 19, target 20, you know, what takes place at the national level is very important. So when people are also reviewing their NBSAPs, they should be reflecting uh, contribution of IPLCs themselves in such documents. So we, we need to be looking at these things, uh, both global, national level, and perhaps much more even at the national level. Because most of those targets, you will see as Coach I said, you, you probably are going to, to still need to, to have IPLC, you know, attending those meetings or participating in it. But maybe just this 19 and 20 tend to be more explicit, but doesn't necessarily exclude them. Your IPOC is from the, the, the other targets, I would say. Thank you very much. Secretariat. Thank you. So um, there's another question, and I think it's um, a, a request for some further clarification, um, and it will be to the, the SBI chair um, and perhaps the SBI secretary as well. And the question is, could you please share how the process of comment statements made during the informal meetings planned for SEPSA 24 and SBI 3 will feed or not feed into the formal meetings um, of the SBI and SUBSTA, um, taking into account that the informal sessions are not are not negotiation sessions. So perhaps um, the SBI secretary or the SBI chair would like to, to, to speak to that point. Thank you. I think the CBD, if, if uh, Jyoti can start, maybe. Okay. Let's go ahead. Um, so as I already said earlier, um, the um, the informal sessions are um, are not sessions where either decisions or negotiations will take place. No decisions will be made, and no uh, decisions uh, will take place. All statements will be uploaded on the website, so you will have access to what everyone has said. Um, however, uh, none of the documents will be changed or updated based on um, the statements made uh, at the uh, SBI or SUPSA session. Um, the, the PRP, the conference room papers that are developed after the first reading, will only take place after um, the agenda items have been opened in the formal session of the SBI. Um, so, um, but we are hoping, and Charlotte may say something on this, that um, uh, that um, uh, the statements made at the uh, at the informal session reflect the 
views of parties and um, observers and stakeholders so that we are able to get an idea on how um, on on uh, what could be included in a an official conference room paper CRP when the formal session starts and the agenda items are opened up for uh, official um, review. Thanks, uh, Charlotte. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jyoti, for this. And I think it's very important to remember that this is an informal meeting. Uh, we have underlined it several times. It's in the formal, no negotiations, no decision, and so forth. Still, uh, all agenda items, I hope that we will have possibility to touch on all agenda items. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hear all views from parties and observers. And of course, hope that uh, it will give us an idea of what uh, or views and ideas already now, so we can capture the discussion somehow. I think it's useful for all of us to also have a possibility to express comments, so it can be listened to others as well. So take this opportunity, of course, but saying that, I have to underline it again, it's an informal meeting, and uh, we also need to take that into consideration that we need to assess afterwards how it worked and uh, make sure that, uh, I mean, virtual meetings new for us, we need to, to learn from this, but take the opportunity and uh, prepare and, and then we're looking forward to all your contributions. Thank you. And more questions, Kieran, or have we covered everything now? <laughs> Um, no, no, so there, there are a few more that keep coming in, uh, um, and in fact, um, just to someone in the in the questions has asked how to sum, submit a question, um, and what happens when you do that. So, in fact, what you need to do is in the question window um, in the the platform. If you enter your question, it's sent it's sent directly to the organizers. So you just need to type your question into the question box, um, and please, for to help us manage the questions, please, if you could include your name and. Um, party or organizational affiliation. So that, that's, um, just wanted to say that because there were a few questions about it. Um, and now uh, a question for the, the co-chairs of the Open Ended Working Group. Um, so there was a question with regards to potential um, sort of uh, perhaps duplications or, or overlaps um, in the different parts of this, of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, and the question is, is how, uh, would be the best way of managing those potential duplications or, or trade-offs that may exist. Thank you. Co-chairs. Thank you. That's that's a that's a really good question, and and some probably somebody that uh, uh, was sitting in the corner of the room when when we we're doing those sessions with Francis and the Secretariat. Um, we're very mindful that the the parties have asked us to do a simple easy to communicate uh, proposal for to to do be discussed um, we were we're at 20 targets and, and and definitely I think the appetite to have more targets is very limited so we're gonna need to be very efficient in in the way we use things and um, it, it is important to to help us trying to find uh, the right language and I don't want to imply that the, the language is currently in the updated, uh, framework is 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 uh, is excellent. It is it is the best we can do with what we have, and I'm sure that uh, the advice we're going to get from SBI and from Substack will help us e do it even better. So keep that in mind. I think we're trying to avoid overlap and duplication. We're also trying to avoid having gaps in the framework. So so it's a very difficult uh, balance. In in some places, we've chosen an approach by by uh, uh, by which, for example, on the uh, on the regulation service, one regulation service is is proposed to be taken care of. Like those that are related to climate change, are are, are taken care of under target seven. But then the list of IPES regulation service has 14 of them. So the other ones are are treated a little bit later. I think it's target 10. So so we've taken some time this. Approach. We have to split things so we grouped all the climate change together, and we have the rest somewhere else. 
Um, so uh, do not be shy in terms of contacting us if, if you feel there is a question about understanding what we meant and, and we will be attending the, the SPI uh, informal meeting and we'll be there to explain what is behind the language. And, and, and if, you, if you feel there is a better way to deal with that, please, please let us know. We're, we're, we don't expect that the end products will look anywhere close to what we have on the table now, and, and that is a good thing. So, uh, Francis, anything to add to that? Yeah, um, thank you, Co-Chair. Um, I think, as you said, we, we will be flexible in terms of handling uh, some of these issues when they come up and we clearly see that um, it has been pointed out, uh, those areas where duplication is seen. So I think uh, we, as the discussions go on, such things need to be pointed out uh, other than just stated. If people see potential areas where duplication is, whether in the targets or otherwise, we need to see it and then, um, and then try to address that. But again, the negotiation of the language, of course, of the of 2020 itself will uh, take place mainly at uh, the third meeting of the Open and Open Group. So that's where views will come in and we need to we do our best because we may not have another meeting after that last meeting of the working group. But having said that, um, if you look at draft zero, it had, I think, five goals. After the meeting in Rome, we had that we needed to merge some. And so that is what happened in, in, in the updated uh, zero draft. So as long as the guidance comes from parties, people point out here, this and that needs to be, we will always reflect on them and see how to, 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 to make sure that this framework here is one thing that, I mean, it is going to be appreciated and uh, owned by different stakeholders. We want everybody to be on board and to appreciate that it is a good framework. So we'll be mindful of uh, those comments as they come along. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for that answer and also thank you for the invitation to listen to more comments and um, I think we, it's very good that we help each other on this. So I have to ask the Secretariat about the timing now. I think we don't have much time left, even if I understand there might be more questions, Secretariat. Yes, and in fact, uh, Chair, we had um, the session is, needs to end at 10 o'clock. So, um, given the, the current time, um, you may wish to bring the session to a close. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And, and I really appreciate all the questions raised. This is really a good possibility also for us to listen to all the questions and uh, take them into consideration in our preparations further ahead. So, dear colleagues, this now brings us to the end of today's webinar. Thank you all for participating today and I hope that you all found the webinar informative and that you will be helpful in your preparation for SBI 3. And as you continue to prepare for SBI 3, I hope that many of you also will participate in the webinars later this week. Please remember one on Thursday on the SBI agenda item 9. And also, of course, the webinars plan next week for the subsequent four briefing webinars. I would also like to thank the executive secretary and her team for preparing and organizing the session. And I would also like to thank, special thanks to the co-chairs, the Open Work and the Working Group for their very useful presentations. So that brings us to the end. Thank you very much all. This webinar is now concluded. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.